So our next panel will be discussing the importance of reducing consumer food waste. Um, if Australia is to reach the goal of halving food waste by 2030, I'm looking forward to hearing about how we as humans can behave inconsistently, oddly and not in our own interests. Sounds like Adam's, that's your area. And how we, government, industry and a nationwide consumer behaviour change campaign can engage and support fighting food waste in homes and businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next panel. Our facilitator is Claire Neller, Head of Voluntary Agreement Partnerships with Stop Food Waste Australia. Adam Ferrier. Dr David Pearson, Engage Program Leader, Fight Food Waste CRC. Amanda Kane, Organics Manager, Circular Economy Programs, New South Wales Environment Protection Authority. And Simon Jackson, the Head of Operational Corporate Social Responsibility with Compass Group. Take it away, Claire. Thank you so much, Pip, and thank you, everyone, for, for attending this talk. Um, I could have had 20 people on this panel, I think, given the interest in this uh, subject matter today. I'm just going to take the chair's privilege just to kind of bring together a few of the threads um, that we've heard so far before we delve into the questions. Um, please do put your questions in the app. Um, for the for the panel um, as we're going through. Um, I'm expecting lots and lots of in, very intelligent questions from you all. Um, I think it's actually really useful and prescient for this panel to, to start with an acknowledgement of the indigenous people on whose land uh, we meet today because they are the ultimate food waste preventers. Um, indigenous peoples around the world have skills and capabilities in this area that we really need to tap into. But also, it's taken us a very short time, a few generations, to lose those same skills. So in the post-war generation, food didn't get wasted. Food was a precious commodity. Um, and we very rapidly transitioned away from some of those uh, skills and behaviors. Um, I thought what I might do to start off with um, is a little bit of citizen science. We love citizen science. So could you all stand up, please? It's just two, two quick things. So stay standing if you eat the crusts on your bread. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, stay standing if you eat apple cores. There's no judgment. This is, this is science. So congratulations, because you are consistent with every other OECD country. You can, you can sit down now. Um, yeah, that was a piece of work that was done on what's called edibility um, to figure out for the country that you live in, what's classed as edible and what's classed as inedible. And, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle of the category that's really variable depending on where you live and who you are. Um, but you'll be glad to know you're very consistent. Um, like I said, I could have had 20 people on this panel. I'm thrilled to have the people that I do have here. Um, consumer food waste is rightly and encouragingly front of mind for us all, we need to deliver a 30% reduction in household food waste if we are going to deliver our halving food waste target. And that's assuming that we deliver all of the other reductions across the rest of the supply chain that the feasibility study talks about. We're wasting 2.4 million tons of food from our homes, and most of that was edible. That's about $2,700 per person per year. So a uh, piece of research got done, got published this year in September by Rapp and Unilever that looked at that kind of cost of living impact on Australian households um, in comparison with the US, the UK and Canada and just trying to account for some of those cost of living increases. So that's a pretty chunky amount of money that we're throwing in the bin every year that we don't need to. 
Um, but no one sets out to waste food. We all know that. There's a whole host of behaviors that we need to address. The research from the CRC, from Oz Harvest, from others has really shown us that. And that behavior change is a whole science. Um, we need to be addressing both sides of the coin. So the bit where we talk directly to people about food waste and using all of the um, amazing kind of brand attributes that we want to be able to leverage, but also how do we make changes to the products, to the packaging, to the retail environment um, to help people change their behavior uh, subconsciously. So I am going to delve into the panel. Um, so my first question to my panel, and this is for all of you, um, a lot of us who are in this space have some kind of food waste inception story. So what was the thing um, that got you into this game? Um, mine was that I used to uh, help my granny. She used to run a B&B. &B. One time we were cleaning out the fridge and she had like half a lemon in the door of the fridge and you know you cut it and it's gone like a bit dry and looks a bit manky. And I said, oh, I'll throw this away, shall I? And she said, no, 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 I'll find a use for it. And that's just really kind of epitomizes not just my granny, um, who was very thrifty, but also that whole idea of finding a use for things. So I'm really curious. I'm going to start down the end. Simon, what's your food waste inception story? Um, oh, gosh, I started as a chef many years ago. Um, and I was in a I was 15 and a half Italian restaurant. Didn't speak a word of Italian. Um, the only kind of Anglo, Anglo kid there. Um, and threw out a bucket of the cream that I tipped out and there was still, I don't know, 200 mils worth of cream in the bottom and got a quick wrap over the back of the head of, that's two desserts there, we can turn that into $20, what are you doing, that's your salary for the day, all those kind of things. So from that moment, um, I've always looked at waste as, as value, so, yep. Awesome, Amanda? Um, so mine was um, a bit more pedestrian actually than that one. It was like, I, so before I, I got this, job, which is where I live and breathe food waste avoidance. Um, I used to be a journalist and I was working in public affairs and I wrote a media release about Love Food Hate Waste and it was like 2009 and it was when New South Wales took up Love Food Hate Waste as its program and um, yeah, saw the data basically, saw how the greenhouse gas emissions impact and I remember thinking and it wasn't, uh, well, the food waste itself wasn't the thing, but it was also all of the wastage in bringing that food to the table, because that's, you know, obviously I needed to make it sound exciting. Um, but yeah, like everything that it took to get there, and then we end up throwing it in the bin. And it was at that point that I was like, oh, wow. And then like seven years later, um, the guy that was looking after the organics program retired. And I went, do you think I could have a little go at that job while we're recruiting? Because I could look after Love Food Hate Waste, and that could be really nice, and I did. And here I am, six years later. So, yes. And we're very glad to and, have you. And, and even though, sadly, though, with all of that, is that not actually that much has changed in terms of the behaviors and the challenges, and even though we've known for a long time about those emissions impacts, like climate change itself. But we're working on it. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to get there by time. I'm going to come back to that in a second. David, tell us your story. So I, I love uh, thinking, researching, and sharing. And as a professor of social marketing, I get to do a lot of that. And I was at a conference, and someone asked me what, what they could do to improve the health and environmental sustainability of their diet. And at the time, I thought, I don't know. So I'll go and investigate that. And I found that globally, we didn't really have a good idea. So I did some research around that. And the interesting thing, there's about 12 things we could do, but when you talk to consumers, there was only two of them that they're interested in doing, two changes that they're interested in making them. And one of those was to reduce the amount of junk food they eat, and the other one was to reduce food waste. And I thought, aha, here's a real opportunity to use my position as a researcher, as an academic, to contribute to something that's socially good in our society. So food waste is my story. Excellent. Adam? Um, I, um, I do the cooking in my family, and uh, last night I was telling my wife, as I was scraping off all the, um, the food scraps into the bin, um, I reckon probably about a third of the food I cook every night goes into the bin, all in one kind of bin. And I was saying to Anna, God, I hope, you know, like if I could see me now, 
how embarrassing would that be? Um, because we waste so much food. And she said, no, 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 we're very good. Like, we don't waste much. And so I don't think I've had my inception moment, and nor do I have a clue whether we waste food or not. We do. Yeah, I reckon. I, I <laughs> reckon we does. do. Yes, yeah. Definitely. Everybody does. Um, that's a really interesting point, actually. So some research that got done in the UK basically found that most people put, them in the, put themselves in the category that said, I waste hardly any food or no food at all. In actual fact, most people, the same number of people are in the kind of the top two wasting categories. And I think this comes back to this idea that people don't want to waste food. They don't deliberately set out to waste food. It's as a result of a bunch of other behaviors that are happening in and out of the home um, that are resulting in, in food waste. Um, just kind of want to keep it still a little bit high level before we delve down into some of that detail. Um, I'm curious to hear um, what are some of the kind of highs and lows that you've experienced in your journeys around trying to change people's behaviors? So on the research side, whether Adam, it's from campaigns that you've been involved in. Um, just tell us a bit about kind of what you learned from some of those experiences. I'm gonna start with you, Adam, from this. Me? Yeah. I just reckon I spoke about it for 40, <laughs> 40 minutes. minutes. I go to someone else. Anyway. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Sure. Um, what I find super exciting in this space is habits. And habits are just a simple tool we use so that we don't have to think. And the interesting thing about habits is once they exist, they're very, very stable. They're hard to shift. So as a researcher, as a researcher in food waste, what are the habits that we can encourage and then groove deeply to help individuals stop wasting food and that's the challenge that me and the teams that I contribute to are working on. Yeah and go through the kids. Absolutely yeah, yeah. start at the younger generations. Yeah. And just Adam like from your experience I know you've, you have just talked about some of that but like what are some ways of, of actually like kind of really practically doing that, of talking to kids about wasting food? I mean, we can do it in schools, but how do we make that really sticky? Um, I think, I think uh, so I think mo most of our brains form uh, from about the age, no, um, we're more malleable when we're kids. So you can get kids to act in more moral ways and be the policeman for the family, but um, far easier than you can starting older. Also, when the, what we learn is, teenagers becomes really, really impressionable and hard to shake as we get older. So I would say anything we do that targets children seems to have much faster pickup and much faster adoption. So getting them to be the little Trojan horses of behaviour change is, um, if you've got something pro-social, which we do in this case, mm -hmm. it's a really effective strategy. So... Um, that's a great piece of advice. Amanda, as a kind of practitioner in this space, and, and Simon, I'm curious from your perspective as well, like, what are some, have you tried that? What are some kind of examples of where you've been engaging with the kind of young people or youth and you might have seen some results on that? Yeah, um, for a long time we, we weren't engaging with children because the focus was on the buyers of the food and the you know the cook, cooks and the purchasers it was sort of a very much an adult targeted education program that we were delivering but um, we've definitely uh, moved into that area we've got a, um, a curriculum guide for schools that we worked on with sustainability victoria and and um, having that sort of engagement i mean children are just lovely to work with as well too you know they're always like you know really smart and they kind of um, take really good photos as well too, which is handy. Um, but recent, most recently, we did a partnership on a, a, with um, an organisation called Feedback Organics in Newcastle, which was a youth engagement project where they got uh, uni students to pitch for projects that um, reduce food waste. And that was um, that was brilliant because it was just young people and it was students uh, working on it. And they've just put a podcast on um, now as well, two of two of the students who. Um, yeah, they just did a whole load of things with uni students, which were just like working with their peers, engaging with them on that sort of like level. And um, 
what was quite interesting, which I think is the constant challenge that we have, is that these two young women who ran this project and they were really kind of like passionate about it and they, they did these pop-up events and they were engaging people. And she said at some points though, you just wanted to um, just like slap people and just say, when do you realize how important this issue is and get them somehow to turn their heads? And, uh, and I thought that was really interesting because even among their young people in their cohorts, they still have that same challenge of people just not kind of like caring <laughs> or something. But anyway, but, uh, you know, it's, it's those little increments of things, I think, that will, all, you know, that will add up. But I, I think we definitely need a, the rebrand and that a whole kind of like different shift in, in everybody's thinking about it. Um, yeah, and... and mm, absolutely. Um, I'm just kind of linking into that idea of kind of everybody's got to do something about it. Simon, you come at this from a bit of a different perspective. Um, you're from Compass. Just tell us a little bit about kind of where you're at in your role now and kind of the engagement that you've had around this food waste prevention piece. Cool. Um, well, I think, yeah, the only experience the kids I have is my two daughters and it's incomprehensible to them the amount, the dollar, the kilo, the the volume of the problem, they just don't understand it. We were actually talking about it last night. So um, so that's all my exposure to kids. But if we look at our operations, so we, we have 14,000 employees across Australia. Um, we serve you know, about 70 million meals a year now um, across the country. So um, globally 5.5 billion, I found out today as well. So the challenge we have with consumers, I guess it's consumer is one thing, contract is another, and then our staff's perception of waste and what they're doing because it's never really been measured before. So now they're starting to see it. And um, we've deployed uh, Lean Path, a, a um, food loss prevention uh, weighing system across our top 100 sites so far this year. That drives about 85% of our cost of goods spend um, in Australia. So we've got this long tail behind it, but this, this big chunk up there, since we've deployed that, um, we've already got three and a half million dollars worth of food waste tracked already, and that's in five months. So. For us, um, there's, there's, I guess, a few approaches we're looking at. First of all, there's a, a commercial value behind that, but it's also the biggest lever we have to decarbonise our business. So that is the primary focus. If we start talking to our frontline teams, our clients and the consumers about money and, and actually saving money by doing this, you've got clients who are looking for money back, consumers going, I'm getting less on my plate, and then our staff going, well, hang on a minute, so why are we trying to save a multinational money? That's, so we really, I guess, we're challenged. We're quite, um, I guess, young in that journey. We've, we've had different types of food loss prevention activities previously, um, but you know, we started off with one, uh, one manager, or you know, my colleague who's here today, rolling out that program. I think we're up to about five in that now, um, just recognizing the challenge. Um, and it's flipped from a commercial discussion to being a hearts and minds conversation because it's, People don't want to hear about the money on all three of those fronts. It's around how do we engage um, the front line. And I think we're starting to work through, and I read some the other day around you know, identifying who's who in the zoo and what do, they, what do we want them to do. And that's really important because it's not a broad brush purpose kind of conversation. It's around how is each of the levels of our organisation going to help change the mindset and, and get us to where we need to go because it's not a top down, we can roll out a, a food loss prevention activity or program, but actually getting the frontline team to be measuring and then that bias of going, okay, well, heck, I peeled the watermelon today and it was 200 kilos worth of skin. So shout out to any fruit veg suppliers who can, that's our number one problem is, is watermelon skin. If we can get watermelon without skin, we're done. Um, <laughs> But, and, but then my colleague yesterday did the same thing and that was three quarters of the amount. So then how much am I wasting things? Oh, hang on a minute, am I doing it wrong? We've got huge problems throughout APAC region around cultural shifts around recording waste where it is really quite regimented and, and people are quite scared to report it. Um, whereas at home, they're reasonably conscious of it in our field. So um, it's super complex. I don't think there's a simple answer, but we've, we've got a long way to go. At least we've, we're measuring it and we can track it and actually understand it now. That's our, our biggest win at this point. Yeah. I've just remembered like that 
um, behavior works what they, so that did mid, what they did with mid waste in the schools where they tested the three interventions for school children and there was there was my favorite which I was sure was going to win which was um, instead of eat then play do play then eat you know which was there, which has had nothing to do with many messaging or anything it was just changing the way they did it because the kids are just racing to they have a bite and then they throw it away and they go and play and then they did involving the children making their own lunches and then the third one was taking their leftovers home so the parents could see how much the kids weren't eating for lunch. Anyway, the play the eat thing was the least in terms of actual volumes of food waste. The singular best thing that they could do is actually have the children involved in eating lunches. And interestingly, across all of the, the schools, the children didn't actually choose to put in their lunches what their parents did which is why they ate it, because they actually put it in food that they wanted. And it wasn't like awful food or anything. It was things like quiche instead of sandwiches. Mm. But um, yeah, and then the other one was taking the leftovers home. But um, yeah, so there has been that piece of work that's happening. And then some, those councils are continuing to run those schools programs, in, yeah, which is really good. And the, yeah, it is getting those children on board. Yeah, excellent. I think with kids as well, with mine in particular, my biggest discussion to them is around use by and best before. And just because that date's gone, it is, you know, as, as to shout out the chefs in the room, like you smell it, if it's any kind of puffed or if there's something, if it fizzes when you open it, it's done. If in doubt, chuck it out. But there is absolutely that element of if it's, it, and especially with fruit and vegetables, they actually get better as they start breaking down and the sugars develop. And as an apprentice working in an Italian restaurant, the core thing was tomatoes. And we would just buy straight off the back of a truck from the markets. This guy would rock up every morning or, you know, a couple of times a week. And I used that was the first job I ever had was sorting tomatoes into three different things. So sourcing, bruschetta, and then other like garnish type things. So it was because everything we would just let develop. It's everyone's just scared about throwing food out that they're going to get sick. But it's actually pretty hard. Controversially, it's pretty hard to get sick with food unless it's absolutely gone. Like it, it's yeah. Yeah, so maybe we'll put you on a helpline with Pep's yeah. mum. Um, yeah. You can just ring up. Yeah. Um, My sister sends me photos now as well of like, is this still good? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's totally good. Yeah. Cut that bit off, use that bit, it's totally fine. Yeah. I want to touch on something you said, Simon, just links into one of the questions that we've had here, which is the fact that we all work in this space, right? So this is our job, but we're all also consumers. And it's that kind of interaction um, between us as consumers and us in our roles. And, and Adam, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on kind of how you square that circle, those two identities of your professional self and your reducing food waste as a job versus yourself as a consumer, because that's we, like we all do consume food. Um, and how we kind of um, leverage some of those connections between those two identities. Well, I'm not um, in your community. I know you, I'm, I feel like I'm um, the recipient of a message, um, except for today. And so when I, when I was outside eating the buffet, I made sure I ate everything on my plate. Because uh, I, I knew this, I had to do that. And, um, and so I think, and I think once you're part, once you're part of the organisation, once you're part of the community, then you are, as I was mentioning before, you are the departure point for communications. You're not the end point. You are the community. And I think what I think what's missing is a unified, simple narrative. Um, and then that's you know, what's your slip, slop, slap? What are you asking people to do? What at its, is its most fundamental, simple level? And then once, as a community, you understand that and have that, then it flows through everything. And then all of the voices in this room get stronger because they're all saying exactly the same thing. Sure. Um, David, just from a kind of research perspective, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that kind of because I know you've been looking at the household stuff, but you've also been looking yeah. at the business side of things as well. What are your thoughts on this kind of two sides of the coin yeah. element? So the way, the way I approach it is I'm, I'm a person and I happen to work in the food waste space. So I have a professional role there and I'm a person in my home, in my, my community. And when I think about what influence I can have, I think absolutely I can be the role model for the change that I want to see in the world 
in my personal life. And that's, that's a choice, and I, I, I feel that's an opportunity for all of us, that we can be very strong role models in that. All of us have an audience. In my professional life, I have a responsibility and, and a different audience, and I can certainly do a, a lot and have an influence in a different part of our society. And to me, that leads me to the place of thinking, food waste is a team sport. And my, my biggest contribution is probably around what I choose to do and helping other people around me to do more to reduce food waste. And that's how I, I see it, that strong team sport, doing it myself, being the role model, and helping other people who I happen to be able to influence. Thanks. So um, can I answer that question as well? I'm not sure. around about the, thing, the um, work and personal. So I'm, I've learned that um, my thinking on food waste bears no relation to the rest of the New South Wales population, basically. <laughs> and whatever I think is wrong. Like because of because uh, of that, and it was proven. We did a we did some Ipsos research where we were testing this sort of messaging and things. And one of the things was like this: what's for dinner? Question mark. You know, to to for meal planning and so on and everything. And then it was one of those um, social research where you're looking through a glass thing in Western Sydney, and people were like, I don't know what that means. That's ridiculous. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Like you should just say what it is, which is like plan your meals. You know, whatever. And then with the photos, we had all these gorgeous images of food looking all really nice and everything and people went yeah that might don't look like in my house and came up with the and when we showed them a banana that was slightly kind of blackening people went oh that makes you think of banana bread and use it up and we realized that yeah anyway so I just at that moment I thought never trust what I say again like before <laughs> testing it with people because I just don't think like day. anybody else yeah. except on this panel obviously yeah, oh yeah well obviously yes I'm, a, I'm among <laughs> Single, uh, similarly minded people here, I think. Yeah. Um, one thing that's really clear from, from this conversation, but also the broader conversation today and beyond, is that this, like, to change people's behaviours has to be a collaborative effort. Um, and, I don't know, mildly controversial question to the panel, like, who's stepping up and who needs to be doing more in this space? I'm going to put you on the spot first, Amanda. Oh, <laughs> okay. I was going to leave that one to the others. And everything. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think governments and and councils and and those organisations are trying to step up, but it's very difficult. You know, we've been kind of investing in community education and working to to um, educate for for a while, um, but I think the gap. I've, well, the, the, the gap is, and, and it's really not shifting the dial. I mean, there's a lot of pe people do care about it. Awareness is still really high. COVID had quite an impact in just generally changing the way that people, um, everything about the way people shopped and cooked and thought about meals. But um, I think the, the gap is in all of the other intervention points, in the packaging, in reminding people how to store things properly, in the purchasing, if you're buying in bulk, remember to freeze, you know. It's all of those other points of decisions making. And that's the challenge with food waste behaviors, as you said, it's like, it's not one thing, it's a whole load of multiple things. And, um, and that's really hard for any individual to, to do unless there's a really good motivation for it, like because it's their job or something, you know, like so um, I think that the, the needing to help people all the way along in, in those sort of like, um, in the, when, when those decisions are being made about what happens to that piece of food they've got in the free, fridge or something um, is, is the gap. Mm. And um, that's why we can't, any one of us can do it alone. We all have to be working together, every part of the supply chain, yeah, I think. Thanks. Simon, curious to hear your thoughts on that from kind of the business perspective. Like, is there an equal amount of effort happening? Like who, where do we need to kind of rebalance or do we need to rebalance? Um, you can dub yourself in at the same time. Yeah, it's, as well. it's quite it tough. Have to I be. think <laughs> food waste from our, I guess, through the, I guess, tracking lean path, you're also just tracking our food waste, gives us the ability to have meaningful conversations with our client that used to be anecdotal. So it used to be, you know, this scope says that you must be open in this mess hall for this many thousand uh, residents 
and have this amount of food open from this amount of time to this time and it has to be full trays from this and bountiful and plentiful. We are talking about it before outside that um, you know, merchandising needs to change because merchandising in people's eyes, if you walk into a service station or a supermarket and there's empty shelves, you're like, hang on a minute, what's going on? But full shelves, full racks, full serveries, full bowls means waste because people eat with their eyes and take too much, generally speaking. So... Um, yeah, what we're seeing through, I guess, the, the quantitative data we have now is actually being able to have meaningful conversations to go back to, to clients and have prescriptive conversations around what we need to change because when we look at it from a sustainability angle as well, you know, 98% of our opportunity as a business sits in our scope three um, and that in turn sits in our client scope three. So it, if anything, the increased attention around sustainability and, and the the positive outcomes are coming because we have to collaborate. So it, it's gone from being a, you will do this, to a, heck, hang on a minute, we need to start changing the way we do things and, and look at um, more sustainable options, which will drive food efficiency. Great, thank you. David. So I, I think what we need is some really simple messages and let's hang them all on a brand. So the creation of a brand, simple messages. We don't know what the brand is, so we need to do that. We actually do know what the behaviours we want to change and we can fairly quickly create the simple messages. What are they? What are the around... top three that account for the most variance? So in the, the most recent research completed in Australia, so the most comprehensive research ever undertaken in Australia on what's happening in households around food and the behaviours that are leading to food waste has been identified the three top three things and they are cook the appropriate amount of food have a flexible plan for your meals, and then use up your leftovers. Cool. So that's great. You're part of a solution. Yep. Um, I, try, I just Googled how to, um, what to do to uh, stop wasting food, and I think it was like, yep. uh, just, it, it was impossible. So, I ne so just the fact that you can say those three things yep. confidently yep. and based on evidence, it's just, it's, it's just wonderful to hear. That's great. So let, let's, let's get that simple message. Let's amplify that message so every touch point with the consumer is saying the same thing. And then let's repeat it over a sustained period of time to change the habits, as I said before. So what's the, what's the thing that's stopping us from doing that? We need a national platform to coordinate that. So when we hit, talk about a nationwide consumer food waste reduction behaviour change plan, plan program, that's what we're talking about. So that catalytic investment at a national level that then all the goodwill and the existing activities from organisations can jump on board and create that consistency. Awesome. Thanks, David. Um, I've got a question here for you, Adam. Um, which is better, uh, communicating to consumers how their effort impacts the environment or how their effort benefits them? Uh, it's maybe, I mean, obviously the, the right answer is how, how it benefits them. But I do, I do believe in, um, I think things like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Greta Thunberg, and, and, um, and just the, the general decay of the world and the planet is making the next generation of people uh, more hopeful and, and have more agency than, than older people. And so I think if you ask them, if you ask that cohort, they may well start to say and may well start to sincerely believe that it's better to be more collective in, in your um, point of view rather than be more, more hedonistic or self-focused. Um, however, I would make sure... I'll, I'll take that with a grain of salt as well. That's me being optimistic. I think we're, we're absolutely self-centred humans and... Um, and there's lots and lots of case studies. I think what's really important is once we get the strategy right of what are the behaviours to change, what are those three things, then we throw the science away and we just make it as cool and interesting and compelling as possible. And I think that's a really hard shift for any organisation, pro-social group of people to, uh, to do because they get overly worthy and overly caught up in their own importance and... And, and risk averse and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, th I do think you need to get the evidence and then get out of the way and let someone else brand it. Great advice, <laughs> I think. 
we could all take that home with us. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to get out of the way, but I would like to, <laughs> I would like to evaluate the interventions. So I would like to measure the impact of the interventions. Sure, measure the behaviours. Don't, I think don't ask people yeah. what they think of things. Just Actually, measure the, yeah. the effect on behaviour change. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, to, to, to coming back to something we were just talking about just now, about kind of just make it everywhere. Um, and Adam, start with you on this, but go down the panel as well. In terms of things like social norming, so it's not that you're telling people to um, use up their leftovers, but actually whenever you watch a reality TV program or a film or a series, that's what people do on that show. Like, how do you think, like, number one, is that effective? But number two, how do we get to do that? Uh, yeah, number one, it is very effective. Um, so we work by modelling. We're social animals. We're herd like behaviour. So we like to do what everyone else is doing, or else we feel exposed and, and out of the herd, which is dangerous. Um, how do we do that? I'm going to sound like a broken record, but we create a brand that's a spreadable idea. It's malleable. It can spread into any kind of system it needs to. We know this is a complicated issue of lots of various stakeholders. So we need a you need a malleable thing up there that everyone can take hold of and own it. And again, I look for things like uh, Me Too and, and Black Lives Matter as very good examples of recent brands that have been created, that people that have been crisp enough, clear enough, have strong enough meaning and easy enough for people to pull on and make their own to then to spread the word. Mm. So, yeah. We nearly had a reality TV show. We were talking with a production company and it was through our Love Food Hate Waste partnership and it was going to, um, didn't have a name, but it was going to be like four families, four boxes of food, one week of fun. And th that families, those families would all do different things because they came from different cultural backgrounds with the food. And they could call a chef if they were desperate at the end and they didn't have anything. Cool. But it just didn't get up. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it is hard to do that kind of stuff. Just make sure if you're doing that, you're going through the content people and not the um, advertising people or else you'll just create a piece of branded content that nobody will watch that will just be a waste of money. The other thing is as well, just thinking about getting to the youth, we did something for NRMA insurance. Uh, it's just really important for people to understand climate change. So to engage younger people, we created a game called Climate Warriors on Minecraft. So we used the Minecraft platform. It, was, it got people to learn about how to... Uh, deal with climate change, what types of buildings to build and so forth. It's all about tackling the next generation. That's had six million downloads and because um, and we've created that entity, it kind of keeps on living, keeps on being circulated um, through Microsoft Education. It's now in the, um, the Australian school curriculum as well. So it just maybe just thinking about going to where the people are, and just also thinking about pre-existing platforms that allow your messages to spread, mm -hmm. rather than trying to create your own thing and then pushing it out there. That's excellent. We are out of time. The, the last thing that I'm going to say, apart from thank you to my amazing panel, is to the like 20 people who've submitted this question, watermelon rind pickles. That's what you should be doing. We can with them. create a market. Seriously. Thank you <laughs> to everybody who submitted that. Um, I'm 12 seconds over, so I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. Thanks.